When I was a young boy many, many years ago, I used to watch this show called Schoolhouse Rock to learn about a wide variety of topics. And I always remember that one, uh, this one called Conjunction Junction, What's Your Function? What's that got to do with my show? I'll tell you in a second. So climb aboard and let's get this train started. It's time for Computer Train, the weekly TV program that trains you how to use your computer. With your host, El Paso Community College faculty member, Russ Meyer. So what does that have to do with my show? Really nothing. The only thing I'm taking out of it is the title related to functions. Uh, that was an English show about uh, conjunctions and how it connected phrases. But I do remember one thing that relates to my show. When they talked about the phrases, they always had uh, train cars. So they had these two train cars that were joined together by a third car. So I guess that's how I tie it in. We're both related to computers. All right, so today I'm going to show you about Excel, and what I'm trying to do is piggyback on a show that we just had related to the specifics of computer. We want to continue that theme a little bit and make sure we understand some very unique specifics. So I'm going to do something today a little higher level in Excel, but I promise I think you can follow along. Before we do that, uh, recently in one of my classes, uh, I had an elderly student who was having trouble following the mouse pointer. Um, he couldn't really see the screen that well, so he gave me a suggestion and asked if I would turn on the mouse trails. And what that is, is when you move your mouse, it kind of shows a trail of the arrow. And I thought that was not only a great idea for my classroom, but I think it's a great idea here for computer train, not to only help you guys follow my mouse pointer, which I probably should have been doing all the time, but in today's show, my producer is taking over the camera duties, so I want to make sure he's paying attention and he's following along. So I'm going to show you how to do that, very simple. First of all, um, those kinds of things that I've shown you in the past are done through the control panel. Uh, but now I'm using Windows 10. Don't forget I showed you about Cortana. We can ask Cortana a wide variety of things. So all I'm going to do is in my Cortana text box, I'm just going to type the word mouse. All right, so now what's much easier, I don't have to go all over the place and figure out where to do these things. So you can see the best match is the control panel, but all these different settings that they have, and really they have one that's exactly what I'm looking for, change how the mouse pointer looks. Okay, so I could go control panel, but one of these options is directly related to what I need. Uh, no, not looks, the mouse pointer display or speed, that's what I want. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of these options. Okay, so first of all, the mouse pointer speed, I'm going to slow it down a little bit, so make sure your eyeballs can catch it. And then the other thing that I'm going to do is the visibility, I'm going to display the pointer trails. So as I'm dragging the mouse, it's going to show you a trail of those pointers so you can pick it up a little bit easier. Okay, so I'll put one of those trails on and put medium on there and slow it down just ever so slightly. Okay, of course on my own computer I don't have the trail showing and I have the mouse speed pretty quick. So let's click OK. And now in the middle I'm going to move my mouse pointer if you want to follow that. You see how you're getting the trail of the mouse pointer as I point to each football that represents a Steeler win. Alright, so now that we have that turned on we want to start talking a little bit about Microsoft Excel and I want you to remember the previous show where I was talking about specifics. This is where if you're not tuned into the specifics and paying attention down to the last character things can go very awry. But if not and you're paying attention it's not that difficult. Alright so first of all we want to discuss a couple of things. I have done Excel in the past shows and I have done functions but I haven't done a little bit more advanced example uh, that I'm doing now and again I'm going to tie it together with the other show. So first of all let's review what functions in Excel are. Alright so what we're trying to do our functions are predetermined calculations which I've mentioned uh, I think in the previous show I got out my cell phone and I said if I want to compute the square root of a number I don't have to do the mathematical calculations. I press type in the number and there is a square root button that is a function. Okay, so Excel is prepared. I believe the new version of Excel, uh, I'm using Excel 2016, I think it has in the neighborhood of about 340 functions now. So anything to do with numbers, it's there for you. Alright, the other thing we want to remember is I've been, you know, really harping on all my shows about learning terminology. A lot of people use these terms interchangeably, functions and formulas. 
Those are two different things. Formulas are anytime we want to do calculations in Excel. And to make those formulas easier, sometimes we use functions. Okay, so functions exist in formulas. Those are not interchangeable words. All right, this is the big key, this next piece of information. All functions require information for them to work properly. Okay, so depending on what the function does, it requires information to do the calculations. Uh, not all functions are mathematical. There's text functions, all sorts of functions. They need information from you in order to work properly. Okay, and that's what we want to make sure we remember from last time. These pieces of information that are required are called arguments. Some functions have one argument. Some functions have five arguments. They're all different. Remember, 340, 50 of them, they're all different. We have to learn, do the tedious work, and learn about each one. This is the part where everybody goes wrong on functions. Each argument has a domain. Okay, that's kind of a mathematical term. The domain in math used to be the set of possible answers. And it's kind of the same thing here. This is the set of possible entries that you would give to that argument. Uh, and if you don't give the argument within the domain, usually what you get is an error message right off the bat. Or you might get erroneous results. Okay, so to give you an example of that, uh, just using normal terminology. If I said, give me a number, I've already narrowed the domain down. I don't want a text, like don't tell me table or computer or keyboard. Those are not numbers. But if you give me any other number, you could give me negative 50, 1 million, 27, 100. As long as you give me a number, that is within the domain of possible answers. I can narrow down the domain. Give me an even number between 2 and 10. Now the only possible entries you could possibly give me are 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Okay, so it's very, very crucial and important that you learn the domain for every single argument that you need to provide information for. If you don't take that time, you're not going to get the function to work properly. It's that simple. Okay, so now what we want to do is where can these values for arguments come from? Okay, simple way to do it is when we get to that argument, we simply use our keyboard and type in the information. Okay? That's not usually how it's done, but it is one way that we can get the information in. All right, another way. This is probably a little bit more common. We retrieve the information from some other location in our worksheet in one of the cells. So when we need information for that argument, we point to the cell and we click on it. Pretty straightforward. It's the next two examples that are going to be a little bit more uh, advanced. Sometimes we have to take information that's on our worksheet and do some mathematical manipulation to it. So we have to do some kind of calculation within the argument to get to that piece of information that we need. It is not on the worksheet itself, but there's information on the worksheet that we can put in a calculation to derive an answer for that particular argument. All right, and the last one is the one I'm going to concentrate on a little bit today, is we calculate it, but we use another function to calculate that information. So that is where we're using a concept called nested function. And this is the little bit more advanced example that I have not done in the past, where you use a function inside a function. Okay, so make sure we learn that definition. A nested function is when you're building a formula using a function and the value for one of the arguments in that function is acquired by some other function. Okay, so you have a function inside a function. If you're not down to the paying attention, the domain, watching the symbols, all that kind of stuff, this is where it just cannot be done. This is not where you just click around on the screen. All right, so let me take you through a couple of examples to demonstrate these different items that I just talked about. All right, so I'm going to switch over to Excel so we can take a, a look at a couple of these examples. One, first of all, very straightforward. Okay, so there is a function that will get Excel to give you a random number. All you have to do is give it two numbers, just like if I asked you to do it. Give me a number, like I said, give me a, 
a number between 1 and 10. Give me a number, in this example I'm going to do 50 and 100. Okay, so this is a very simplistic function, but the first part of this example is I want to show you where things can go awry if you're not paying strict attention to specifics and what you're clicking on. Alright, so we're going to go up here to the formulas ribbon, which is where all of our functions are located. If you know the category, that's great. I'm going to kind of try to save a little bit of time in today's show and not go to the specific category and just show you if you want to get to any function where to go. So to get to any function, we go on the far left where we click on insert function. All right, in that dialog box, make sure you change the category to all if it's not on all. As the term indicates, that gives you a list of every single function, all functions, and it is from A to Z. There are some statistical function, uh, I think it's called Z-test, that is in there. All right, but we're looking for a function called rand between. Basically, random number between two other numbers. Pretty, very simple function. Okay, so if we look here, ran between, nice thing about this syntax, it starts to show you what the arguments are. What are the pieces of information that this function requires in order for it to work properly? And it's very simplistic, just like I said to you, give me a number between 1 and 10. Okay, so this first example, I'm going to type it in. So I'll click OK. All right, so you get a dialog box that gives you text boxes for those pieces of information. First example, I'll do that. Give me a number between 1 and 10. So I'll type them between 1 and 10. Okay, click OK. Pretty straightforward. It gave me a number between 1 and 10, and at this moment, the random number it generated is a 7. Okay, so now I'm going to redo the problem. So I'll erase my entries here. All right, so now we're going to do an example of it being uh, referenced in a cell. So that's what I have these two numbers. I'm going to ask it to give me a number between 50 and 100. But on this one, I'm going to show you, I'm going to make mistakes here. I'm not going to pay attention to specifically what I'm doing. So as I'm hurrying and I'm text messaging, and you know how people like to do you know, five things at the same time, which just means you're not going to do any of them well, I'm going to accidentally misclick and click on text instead of a number. So the low number I'll do right. Give me a number between 50. And on the second one, I'm on the phone texting, and instead of picking a number, this argument must be a number, just like I was explaining to you. If you don't give it a number, it doesn't understand what you're trying to do. So instead of clicking on the 100, I'm accidentally going to click one cell above that and point to a text entry. Okay, so when I do that, look what happens. You can't get any more simple than this function. It's very straightforward. But if you're not paying attention and you don't understand domain and arguments and that whole uh, nine yards that I just told you, even the simplest formula in Excel can go wrong. And remember, it's not just about Excel. This can happen in PowerPoint. It can happen in Word. It can happen in File Manager. It's basically the nature of working with a computer. Okay, so now I'll fix it. And you'll see it works just fine. Instead of the value here, I actually should have typed the value there. And once again, it's going to work just fine now. So a number between 50 and 100 is 82. Watch what happens if I do something else. Okay? If we don't really understand this, you have to give it the low number first and then give it the high number. If you're not paying attention or you don't understand and you reverse that, it won't work. That's kind of like the other show. If I said, give me a number between 50 and 100, you understand what I mean. If I said, give me a number between 100 and 50, a human would still understand what I meant. Computers don't work like that. Okay, so now the low number, I'm going to give it the 100, and the high number, I'm going to give it the 50, which is backwards. Okay, computers don't understand things like that. They have a very specific way they do things, and the, better, the sooner and the better you learn the way that it's expected, uh, the easier they are to use. All right, so we get that out of the way. 
we can type it in, we can use cell references, uh, but we have to learn the domain, you have to make sure you understand the concept of that particular function, even simple ones like ran between. Now I'm going to do a little bit more complicated example, and this one, for the calculated value, I'm going to use another function. Okay, so this is a little invoice, like a receipt. Okay, I'm going to zoom in in a second, but let me just explain it first. Basically, this is a receipt where people are buying tickets for, like at the Plaza Theater. Um, depending on where you want to sit and how many tickets you want, that's going to set up the pricing. Okay, so that's what this table is all about. And then we're going to do some pricing here. So let me zoom in a little bit so we can make sure we see the important part. All right, that looks pretty good. <clears throat> All right, so the quantity of tickets, that's pretty straightforward. This person wants 10 tickets. Okay, the, po the problem with this example is the pricing is dependent on two different pieces of information. It depends on the level of the seats they want. So this particular location has three levels of seats, A, B, and C. Um, as you go higher, the A's are the most expensive, then the B's are less. And then, not only that, in each level you have two different sections, an orchestra section and a balcony section. So you have six different prices depending on the level they want and where they want to sit. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm also going to do another uh, item in Excel that's very easy to do. In the level right here, you understand that I need to type an A, B, or C. If I don't type that and I feed that information to my function, it won't make any sense. So what I can do is I can set this up so that the user cannot accidentally type anything but A, B, C. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a drop-down list. I'm sure all of you are familiar with drop-down lists when you order things off of the internet. There's a list that drops down, like to pick your state, uh, pick your sizes, like medium, large, things like that. Very simple to do. Okay, you have to click on the cell that you want to put that on. Then in the ribbon, I'm going to go to a ribbon called data up here at the top. Okay, in the right over here, we have a drop down menu called data validation. And in that, I'm going to go to a dialog box called data validation. Okay, so right now the validation for any cell obviously is any value. You can type in anything to any cell, but you don't have to have that. You can narrow it down. And this is a very handy one when you have data entry like this. I'm going to change the allow value to a special one called list. Okay, a couple of ways to do it, so I'm going to show you two different ways. In both examples, you have to tell it what is going to be the values in the list. If you use this method, you type in the values and you separate them with commas. Once again, I'm going to show you that if I forget a comma, the comma is being used by the computer. So the values that I want to be in this list are A, comma, B. I'm going to forget a comma on this one just to show you another example of how computers interpret. Okay, so I'm going to click OK. Now if we look at this cell, Notice that I've converted it to a drop-down list. Okay, so now to put in a value, you can click on the list. But here's the part I want to show you that's the mistake. Okay, I have the A and the B, but then the C is not on the third one. And why did that happen? I forgot one little comma on it, and that is what's causing the problem. So let me just fix that really quickly. I needed to type A, comma, B comma C. And now I can pick a value, so I'll sit in level B. Okay, nice way to make sure that person cannot type a value that is not in the list, so that we can't get a letter F or a G or a Z if the person that's doing the data entry is not paying attention. Will they be guaranteed to type in the right level? I don't know, but they can't create a level that doesn't exist. All right, another way to do that, I'm going to do the same thing for location, but I already have those values typed into my worksheet. So instead of typing them myself, I can get them from a list of values that's already in Excel. So I'll click on the cell I want the validation. Go to my data validation. All right, and then change that to list. 
And now the source, instead of typing it out, I'm going to select the cells that have those values. So I selected those two cells. Okay, so now I have that drop down and it already has the values. Okay, so let's say I want to sit in the balcony. All right, so this person wants 10 tickets, wants to sit in level B, and wants to be in the balcony. So we could look at, as humans, we looked at it very quickly. Here's level B, here's balcony, that person should be charged $160. Okay, to do that with Excel, we can use a function called VLOOKUP. It's a table lookup, like we look up information in tables all the time. The V stands for vertical, which means the lookup values are in a column. Okay, first time I'm going to do it manually and show you the problem that, get, that incurs if we have to keep changing the formula. So I'm going to go up to formulas. Once again, insert function. Make sure it's set to all. And I'm looking for a function called VLOOKUP. So in here, we're going to go to our Vs. And we're going to go to VLOOKUP. And I'll click OK. All right, once again, this is a fairly straightforward function. Okay, so I'll explain it to you. Um, the lookup value is the value that you take over here to the table to start the lookup process. Okay, so the pricing is based upon the level. So here's the cell we take to the table. Second question is, where is the table? So we tell Excel where the table is. And here's what's going to become the problem in a second. The third option is once I find the proper row, which column in my table do you, are you trying to return? Okay, and then the range lookup, this is an exact match where I want to match this value with this value. Okay, so pretty simple function, takes a little while to get used to it. Lookup value is the level that they want to sit on. Table array is where is your table. You don't include the column headings. Column headings are for humans, not for computers. Okay, so we select our entire table. And here's the problem that's going to come into play as we do this over and over again. Once it finds the row, which column do I need right now? Well, in this particular person's example, I need the information from column 3. So I would type in a 3 there. And the range lookup is an exact match, and it tells you here, exact match, you type the word false. Okay, I don't want to concentrate too much on the, you know, in intricacies of these functions. I want to do that nested function example, and I don't want to run out of time. All right, so you can see that it comes back with the price of $160, which is correct. B level, balcony. And then I would multiply that times the number of tickets, which, is, which I'll do in a second. All right, so you can see the problem. If the next person wants to sit in the orchestra, this price is wrong because I'm still getting the prices from column 3. So here is where I'm going to use a function in that index number, and I'm going to calculate the function. Sometimes it's going to be a 2, sometimes it's going to be a 3. So I'm going to modify that formula with the function. To do that, we're going to click right up here next to that, which is the f of x. Okay, so I've explained the problem. The index number is not always column 3. Sometimes it's a 2, sometimes it's a 3. So this is an example where I need to calculate the value, and I'm going to cal the, calculate the value utilizing another function. Okay, and the function we're going to use that I've used in the, another show is the if function. The if function returns one of two values, which is perfect for this, based upon data on my worksheet. The only thing you need to remember is if you're utilizing a function inside a dialog box, you don't go up to your formulas ribbon anymore. You come right here to your name box, and this will list functions that are available to you when you're inside a dialog box for a function. Okay, if you've used that function recently, you can pick it from the list or you can go to the dialog box and it's the same as I just did. You look it up using all. We've used the if function in the past, so it's right there. So I'm going to start the if function. It's important to understand now 
if you look here, I'm building the if function as an argument for the VLOOKUP function. It's a function inside a function, nested function. Okay, the logical test is I need to check the location. If the location value is equal to the word orchestra, that means I need to get the pricing from column 2 for my VLOOKUP. So I'm going to return a 2 to the VLOOKUP. Otherwise, they want to sit in the balcony. The balcony prices are in column 3. So now I'm going to get a 2 or a 3 utilizing this function, and it will send that information to this function. Okay, that's pretty common in Excel. A little bit more advanced than you know, average users can handle, but not too bad if you've learned the specifics. Okay, so you can see in this example it's already working. We have B level and the person wants to sit in the orchestra. So it's $200. If I change that to balcony, I don't have to go back and fix my formula. Now it's returning the value from column 3. Okay, function in a function. So now all I need to do is finish this formula and multiply it times how many tickets they want. $160 a piece. They're taking their whole family apparently, 10 tickets, so they owe me $1,600. Okay, so nested functions, pretty common in Excel. I know you can handle it, but you're not going to be able to handle it if you don't start thinking about what the computer needs, what specific information, what symbols, everything like that. Uh, here at the end of the show, I want to remind you that we've put uh, quite, a few sh quite a few shows on YouTube. So if we go over here to YouTube, easiest thing to do is just search on the terms computer train. See if we can find some episodes here. All right, so if we scroll, tell me that I'm on there somewhere. Oh, it's talking about specifics. I didn't spell it properly. See, I messed myself up. Uh, there I am, episode 60. There's the... Episode 56, episode 50. Okay, so take some time, and I hope you uh, enjoyed this episode. We're going to put this one on YouTube. Check it out. Keep working on your specifics, and I'll see you on the next episode of Computer Train. Nice, I like that. I use my hands a lot.